And we're also going to need soil conservation district approval along with our 5G3 permit, which is part and parcel with the soil conservation district approval. As Mr. Melvin has indicated, uh, we do have five balances that are being sought uh, for the project. Uh, one is for lot coverage. 50.6% is proposed, where 45% is permitted on a tracked wide basis. You explain that, that's not typical. Yeah. To the right exhibit. So I'm going to refer back to A1. And A1, you can see this burnt orange dotted line going around. Uh, that is the POD zone, that is the track. That's the final that is in words, but that is not the original tract. The original tract include the mar included the marketplace lot, which was undeveloped. So by virtue of taking that lot out of the zone, that has put all other lots within the zone into a coverage variance situation. Just virtue of the ordinance. So besides the track basically got smaller, the impervious coverage remained the same, so the ratio changed. Right, that is correct. Uh, the second would be for the maximum building elevation of 375 above mean sea level where 379 is proposed. The building that we're proposing, if I go back to A4, is roughly 14 feet in height puts us four feet over the allowable with regard to that. We're in an elevated area. Topographically, this area does slope up. We have tr mature trees all around this site that are 70 to 80 feet tall. So this building will not be extending above those tree lines. It's not gonna have a visual impact uh, from areas surrounding it. And I'm not the planner. I'm just <laughs> trying to give you a little prime. Mr. McDonough is going to clean this up. Uh, also, um, for we're going to go back to A3. On A3, we have a 200-foot buffer along the residential zone. Uh, we are respecting the buffer in its entirety along the single-family homes. The relief we're seeking is from the municipally owned properties, namely uh, block 421, 25.01, and lot, two point, uh, lot 26. Uh, these are Green Acres properties. Uh, but however, there's no impact to the surrounding residential properties. And then also the pr proposed disturbance of steep slopes. Uh, the ordinance permits <coughs> 15 to 20 on, on the range of 15 to 20 percent, 35 percent of those slopes may be disturbed. We're proposing 37.7 percent, a total of 2,200 square feet in exceedance. For slopes greater than 25 percent, 15 percent is allowable. We're proposing 23.3 percent, and as indicated on A2, a majority of these slopes occur along the, the northern portion of the eastern parking field for the existing office building. And as I indicated before, these are man-made slopes. When that park lot was put in, that area was cut down. Could you perhaps with your finger just trace the limit of disturbance? You really can't see it from here, but just to identify the board, what's disturbed and what's not. Okay, so if we, st I'll start just in at the your, corner of the property. Your notes in front of you, you're blocking the view, there you go. <laughs> All right. Starts quarter of the property. It goes along, coincident with the northern property line to the skate park, and then it comes out and around, and comes back in, where this would be. This is a slope. This is a sloped area behind the daycare center. The daycare center is right here, and then it comes right back along this curve line. And this limited disturbance is just for trenching a storm sewer pipe and for the driveway improvements. So the so large dark green area kind of at the elbow, if you will, is not going to be disturbed. Is that correct? Right here? Yes. No, that's not going to be touched. It's, it's, we're just we're touching it. Okay. 
And there's one of the variants, I believe, for signs. Correct. Is that correct? For signs, and that, that that's for the five directional signs where you're allowed one or four square, uh, one sign that can be four square feet in area. Can I ask a question? Um, are, is the daycare center having its own freestanding sign or monument sign out on uh, 202? Yes, it will, and the detail will be provided on the plans. It's not currently on. Okay, because you want to add that for the number of sign variances because that's, that's, that's a different, you know that's where another that variance. Mm -hmm. That sign, uh, bear with me, going to A3, uh, you know. Um, the sign will probably be adjacent to the driveway on the south side because the north side is detention basin. For just for number just, of just signs. Just number of signs. Thank you. Isn't the flagpole considered signage? No. Right now in the I'm the zoning officer. I'm oh. sorry. <laughs> um, and I know Susan asked that. We we ask in the zoning department for you to get a permit for a flag, but we don't count it towards your allotment. Because the ordinance that was never in its intention. Thank you. No problem. So six on. Okay. okay. Right. I have no further questions of the witness. All right. Um, at this time, I'd like to ask uh, our board engineer if he had any uh, questions for the witness. Yeah, two questions. Um, the additional parking lot that's located, you know, east of the existing parking lot. I noticed that it's set back rather far east. Uh, it's not adjoining the existing parking lot. Well, I mean, what's the rationale? If you're saying there's you're there's some equipment in here that we're trying to stay away from. So you 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 can kind of you you can't it tuck it any yeah. closer to the west. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. And then as far as the uh, playground area, it's a large expanse of playground. I'm sure operationally it's needed. Um, what is the playground surface? Is is it uh, is it you know, impervious, like a like a carpet type of thing, or uh, turf? Turf, however, in our drainage calculations, I believe we consider it to be impervious to be more conservative. Okay, so you pick up that, but it does, and it's uh, it's synthetic turf on a, a granule fill. Yes. Okay, and so there would be some percolation through that. So I understand it's good good existing soil there. There are so soils, warmer. man. We can't hold soil. any water. Okay. Uh, well, that's good. That that it has that turf that it would it, it could have some some uh, permeability. Um, and you talked about we talked at length about these basins. Um, you will revise the plans per the per letter with access points uh, yes. to get in and maintain that the plantings in the basin, and you'll you revise the plans yes, the to plan. show the details of the uh, fire retention plantings within the basin. Yes, right now it's just a wild seed mix. We have to add the woody vegetation. Circulation. The um, could you talk about deliveries? Right? What kind of deliveries do you expect? There's no loading zone per se. What would be well, that's the that's an operational, Mr. Pangiano? I'd like to defer that to the operator. All right. As far as circulation, precise. though, um, circulation coming comment? around. We'll, we'll provide the templates for you, uh, which will also include refuse and fire truck, okay. since they weren't uh, weren't originally pro uh, provided. Right. However. I'll defer to the operator, however, I, I do not foresee large vehicles coming to make deliveries to this site. Okay, so there's a pull-up area, likely they'll be pulling up to the front of the building, all likely. Mm -hmm. That's all I really have. Okay. Uh, any members of the board have questions for this witness? Yes, I, I do. Hi. <clears throat> uh, first question is, are, you may not be aware, is the, the, the existing parking lot, my directions are a little off, but the, the one to the one up and over, that one, has that been uh, upgraded in any way since it was opened in 1986? I, could, I don't have that information. I couldn't tell you if it was or was not. I don't, I, I don't have the original design. Okay. The, the reason that I bring that up is obviously because of uh, uh, pervious and uh, surface area. And those old parking lots are, are there's absolutely no no way for water to get through them there's there's not even generally even little uh, little little uh, I don't know what you would call them technically but you know islands where there's trees and plantings that doesn't even look like it has those correct uh, me if I'm one, wrong there's one island mm -hmm. 
in between that spine of parking, and then you have uh, just whatever's in front of the building, and then this aisle in here, all the way on the western side. But the the, air, the the main parking area itself just has that that middle spot, and that that that's, yeah, that's it. it. Um, so w w with that in mind, and then you mentioned the the playground area, uh, same thing. I don't know, is it possible to consider other surfaces because turf is notorious for I, it, it doesn't drain well, right? It drains off. It runs off. It doesn't. It's synthetic turf. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not where you're thinking like the old clay grass fields uh, that, that kids would play on. The synthetic turf is a lot more permeable than asphalt. So the water's going to go through. Not all of it. There will be some runoff in a heavy rainfall. Because right. Okay. Um, and then one other question. The slopes that we're discussing, uh, disturbing. Even though they're man-made, do they facilitate drainage now? No, if anything, the steep slope would just increase the potential for soil erosion from water cascading down. With the with the introduction of retaining walls and a stormwater management system, we're reducing that potential. Okay, thank you. No more questions for me, right now anyway. <laughs> is this witness providing traffic testimony, or is that someone else? I, I can, Mr. Keller uh, provided the draft report which indicated that, you know, the le levels of service will remain unchanged when you compare this to the 2021 no-build condition. Uh, can you just talk about the report. number of trips you anticipate or? Uh, I'd have to get that out of the traffic report. Um, I, I asked that because I, I, are they over 100 trips for this use? Because that's sort of like the uh, right. the standard where you you need to you know take a close look at. It. I realize the county's going to look at. It. Has it been submitted to the county yet for review for traffic? Did you? That was part of our. I, I think it's been submitted. Yeah. yeah. If I may, Mr. Congiano, the the county would have primary jurisdiction over the roadways here. Um, it, you know, the board can look at the off-site traffic, um, but while, while that might be a curiosity, it's a... Uh, it's under their jurisdiction. Yeah, no, understood. Yeah. understood. Uh, if it was readily acceptable, it's, it's okay. I know it's, it's in the report. No, I have it right here. Okay. I just needed, I just had to mm -hmm. get, get to the numbers. This is the report that was filed This is the report that was I'm referring to a report prepared by Bowman Consulting. Uh, it is dated October 28th, 2019, and looking at page four under site tr uh, trip generation and trip distribution, uh, trip generation summary tabulates AM PM peak hour. Table two, the proposed child care center will generate 136 AM peak hour trips, 72 in, 64 out, and 131 trips, 61 in, 69 out during the peak hour, PM. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. A couple questions. Um, I had the exact same question as, uh, as Mr. Cangiano about that parking lot. Um, so the the equipment that's there that you don't want to disturb, what's the nature of that equipment? I'd have to defer to the property. I'm not sure. There's, I'm just there's, curious. There's candy cane pipes coming up. There's, there's some other stuff okay. over there. Uh, when I see stuff like that, it's you know, you steer clear. Send, sending a red flag to me. Okay. okay. Yeah, because it just, in a perfect world, you, you could just keep going. Kind of tucked back. Right, with the bays but, that are know, existing. But What we've tried to do is, you know, kind of, dress it up a little bit with some trees going down along both sides of mm -hmm. the driveway so you only have that smaller break rather, rather than a wide swath. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you spoke about lighting, but uh, I, I don't know if I heard you talk about any lighting on the building, if that's going to happen. Thank you. I missed that. Yeah. Thank you very much. I wasn't sure if I missed it. No, I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the building it will have code compliant light okay. uh, over, over the doors and things like that. Any other board members with questions? Uh, I'm curious a, a little bit more about the bioretention basin. What other alternatives have you considered to accommodate the volume of water, or is that just the best option? That you well, the bioretention basin, there's, there's, there's two aspects of the bioretention basin that it serves. It's, it's for rate reduction mm -hmm. and it's for water quality. Um, you know, we're trying to push more towards 
the more away from the structured detention base and getting more mm -hmm. into, into that, the natural treatment um, on this site. We actually have highly permeable soils. And what happens is when we, when we run our calculation. Could you speak up, please? I'm sorry, because of the, the, the soil permeability, there's not that much runoff that comes off, which means we have to hold that much more back because we have to attenuate the flow. And what happens is because the soil is so permeable, it you know, goes down. Our, like I said, we have spoken to Mr. Cangiano. Um, we both reviewed the BMP manual and saw there were some shortcomings in it, for lack of a better term. Uh, I'm putting it nicely. Uh, but, you know, uh, that's, the, it, that's the best alternative that we could come up with. It's better than going with an underground detention system and a manufactured treatment device. You know, out of sight, out of mind. Mm -hmm. This is in plain sight. This is something that will need to be maintained. You have that visual el uh, element. It's a bit, bit more of a green infrastructure because with bio retention bases, you do get nutrient removal, mm -hmm. where you don't typically get that in manufacturing treatment devices or sand filter. Uh, I just made a comment on that. In my opinion, it's one of the more greener. Uh, uh, type of basins you can use. It utilizes the uh, permeability. It has uh, a lot of vegetation in there for uptake and treatment. It's, it's actually one of the better choices you can use for, for an application like this. Okay. So I, I agree with the applicant on, on using this this type of uh, uh, you know uh, bioretention basin. Well, what storm kind of storms are is it sized for? You want to go ahead. <laughs> Five hundred years storm. <laughs> Uh, regulatory requirements require us to analyze the two-year event, the 10-year event, and the 100-year event. And since we are a major development, we have to uh, have the applicable reductions, which means the two-year outflow has to be reduced 50%. The 10-year has to be reduced 25%, and the 100-year uh, storm has to be reduced uh, 20%. And, and I'll add to that. So what we discussed was... Uh, there, there's a there's a caveat in one of the regulations that uh, they can't store more than a certain percent or a certain storm. Um, they are storing the whole hundred year storm. And the interesting part about this site is really very very little runoff runs off the site. And we don't want them to have more runoff running off than did right. before. Mm -hmm. So what they are going to do, they're going to expand the basin. They're going to lower the elevation of the basin, uh, expand the footprint that would promote more uh, infiltration into the ground. Right. Uh, put additional plantings in there, so I think we came up with a good, um, uh, a good uh, alternative and a good solution. Um, while they will still store and hold the whole hundred-year storm, they they will do so uh, on a larger uh, footprint of the basin. Maybe you just want to uh, discuss where the basin will it will expand. Uh, it's the basin near to the south of the uh, driveway. And they're going to expand that yeah. basin uh, closer, closer to the right of way, and then down toward the existing parking lot, yeah. and get a larger footprint for that area to, to utilize the uptake in in the ground. The, the soils there are fantastic. Uh, they, like he mentioned, they're a soils. They really take up a lot of uh, uh, recharge. So it's it's really the best solution for this, and it's an ideal uh, yeah, setup. Yeah, sounds good. So yeah. I know Bruce brought up the older parking lot, and you're increasing your impervious. You want a variance on that? Would it be any benefit to going into maybe retrofitting a little bit around the old parking lot? Or it, gets, it gets a little bit beyond the, sco the scope of the project okay. at this point. However, I can discuss it with, our, with my client to see if that's something that they would be amenable to. Maybe this is a question for the landscape architect, but who maintains the wooded buffer currently? Because you mentioned that there's a lot of trees in there that are uh, stressed. That's going to be for the landscape architect, because I can tell you he knows less than I do. All right. Uh, okay. That would pr I'd probably have to Perfect. defer to <laughs> our first witness on that. Okay. Because it, it sounds like there's some issues with trees currently, and it would be nice not to have future issues if there could be some sort of a maintenance plan perhaps developed for that buffer so that it, it stays healthy, as healthy as it can. Right. And by, you know, by virtue of this project, we are going to help improve that. Right. If, if the applicant doesn't object, I'm going to create a condition saying that they'll put together our maintenance plan to the satisfaction of our board professionals for the existing trees. Any other questions from the board? Okay. 
Uh, I'll open it up to the public for questions of this witness. All right, seeing none, I'll close the public portion on this and uh, allow you to move on to the next witness. I'll call the architect, Mark Pavey. Uh, if you'd raise your right hand, sir, you swear the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Would you state and spell your name for the record, please? Mark David Pavey, A R K D A B I D P A B E Y. And would you give the board the benefit of your qualifications and experience, please? Have a uh, Bachelor of Architecture from Ball State University, West Virginia, 1977, and licensed first in 1980, licensed in, licensed in 44 states. Including New Jersey? Including New Jersey <laughs> in 1988. I've done nothing but child care since 1987. Wow. Including child care centers for Primrose Schools? Primrose Schools since 1996. And you testified before planning boards or boards of adjustment in New Jersey before? Yes, sir. But never in person? Never in person. And you prepared the plans on file with the board? Yes, sir. Plans? Okay. Does the board have any questions about the qualifications of this witness? Please proceed. Let me mark your exhibits first, Mr. Pavey. I think we're up to A6. If you can just go over to the board, pull yours up, and mark them, and we'll have you run through them. Start with a floor plan. So A6 is the floor plan of the, uh, the daycare center. Do you have a pen mark yeah. put A6 on there? And then what's A7? The date on here is February 5th, 2020. And that's the same as submitted to the board? No changes? That, these plans are consistent with what's going to happen. That date is 926, but it's the same drawing. Okay. We want all the drawings are there. Okay. A7 or elevation? A7 would be exterior elevations. Okay. Same date. Would you like to start inside or outside the building? Pardon me? Start inside, in, inside or outside the building in terms of your testimony. Do you want the floor plan first or do you want the elevation oh, first? We could do the, the floor plan. Okay, first. let's do that. So you're back to A6. Do you want to stay here? Good. Okay. Do that. I, uh, my, uh. So you can hold it. Okay. So you've got the elevations up there. Why don't we just do that first? Oh, okay. So I'll just walk the first. I think the board wants to know what the building will look like, what it's made of, how okay. big it is, that sort of thing, and then what the interior is like, what kind of rooms you're going to have in there. This building is uh, designed so that uh, it matches the area of architecture. We, uh, each elevation has its, uh, there's no back to the building. It's a four-sided building. This uh, proposed primrose of uh, Persephone will be a high-quality child care center with early childhood education for 194 children from ages of six weeks through 12 years. Wow. They're going to they will employ 40 plus teachers and staff with a maximum of 22 teachers on site at any one time. The building will, uh, is 11,560 square feet and the playgrounds are around 15,000 square feet, which is a, is a good sized playground. I think 22. The facility is going to be open from uh, 6 a.m. until 6.30 p.m. Monday through Friday and children will be in their care and on premises at all times except when they take uh, field trips, planned field trips in the area. 
the um, all the work will be done at one time. It's not at any phasing. The uh, there is a local franchise owner that is here tonight to talk about the operation about the company. The uh, we've, we've talked about the traffic in the parking the parking lot is absolutely sized for the, uh, the this size building. It's, it's a good good sized parking lot. The um, building's been designed with a, a ground, uh, excuse me, sorry, tied to the ground with a strong horizontal line, as you can see, uh, defined stone and stucco, or stone base, and with uh, a brick above. Might be helpful if you stand by the exhibit and point okay. this and okay. just kind of just tell the world what they're looking at. We have a, a stone base and brick above. Right, why don't you go to the uh, el the render elevation? It's probably easier to show that. Okay. Yeah. There we go. The entry feature has uh, additional stone and, and features to make it look nice. The, uh, uh, we're trying to make the building look home like. This is a, a place where children will spend the majority of their waking hours during the week. And uh, the building is a T-shaped plan to help break up the mass of the building. And there are features on the roof lines, gables added to help, again, break up the mass of the building. Is the same materials throughout all four sides of the building? Yes, sir. So we, uh, security is the top concern for firm. It was the security provided at the front, is provided at the front door, of course. And uh, every child has to have, their, their parents will bring the child into the building and be checked in, and then they, they leave. The uh, playgrounds are fenced and gated, and I know, or I want to testify that, that we'll use a six foot fence around the perimeter of the playground. The six foot fence will not, will, is, the height that we know the strange parent can't come and snatch a child off the playground. Yeah. The, uh, let's see here. Why don't you just go to, let's go to the inside of the building. Let's just walk us through the floor plan. Okay. The classrooms are all what we would call a closed classroom. There are 11 classrooms. There's two infant rooms, a toddler room, toddler twos, two two-year-olds, a couple two-year-old rooms, two three-year-old rooms, two four-year-old rooms, and then a, an after-school room. This is a pretty typical design for a primrose facility? Yes, sir. Okay. And we'll hear more about the operation from the next witness. Right. And we, we uh, will look at the, uh, the population in the area, and it might be that uh, we don't need the after school program. This will increase the number of uh, infants, typically, anymore. Infants, two or two, are much more in demand than after schoolers. And there's flexibility in design. You could change the rooms from one group of It is flexibility. Flexibility is very important. Okay. Any questions for the witness? Um, we'll start with the planner. Just, just one. Um, so, is there sort of a model uh, for Primrose, or do you do you sort of uh, tailor it per location? I'm I'm familiar with the one in Springfield, but do they all kind of look very similar, or are they you know the architecture? Are they tailored for each and each location? The exterior is tailored. Okay. And you know, we, if you have ideas or, or okay, just any curious. suggestions, we vary. Does the board engineer have any questions no, for this witness? No. Have. Okay. Uh, the board, any sure. questions? <coughs> I, I guess we can wait for the... Judy? The next witness is the operator. Yeah, the operator. Okay. 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 Um, Chair, we got some down the other end. Okay. The, the grass in the front, is that real grass or is that the artificial turf also? That would be... <laughs> 
It looked like the artificial because you're showing it on the playground, yeah, too. Yeah, and then a rendering. This would be artificial turf behind the, the six foot fence. This typically is sod. Okay. So, and the, this typically is annuals or flowers. Very, there's a lot of landscaping and planting in front of the building. And the operator would be responsible for maintaining the, the sod? Correct. Any other board questions? I, I, I have a question about, uh, do you have an indoor recreation area of any kind uh, planned? We do not. Okay. So the, the children would use recreation inside the rooms if yes. for bad weather? And they'll go outside. Whenever we'll possible. Go, yes, whenever possible. <laughs> okay. Uh, any questions from the public of this witness? Okay, seeing no one come forward. Thank you. Witness is ex Matt Taylor. Mr. Melvin, this is the operator of the site, fact Correct. witness. And then we have uh, the planners, I'll ask them. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. You raise your right hand, sir. You swear the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Would you state and spell the name, your, your name for the record, please? Matthew Taylor, M A T T H E W T A Y L R. Your witness. And you're employed by Mr. Taylor? I'm employed by Primrose Schools. I've been, I'm sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I've been employed with them uh, just over four years, uh, but I have about 18 years of history with other child care providers doing development as well. I'm very familiar with the product. What do you tell us about Primrose, who they are, what they do? Are they in New Jersey, other states? Yeah, Primrose is actually based in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, they've been in business a little over 30 years. Uh, we have a footprint of 400. 30 schools across the country, uh, approximately 10 in the state of New Jersey, with about another four or five, including this one, uh, slated for the next two or three years in New Jersey as well. Uh, we look for markets much like uh, for Symphony, where you've got uh, educated populations looking for uh, early childhood education, education based programs, and that's what we offer. So that's, that's really why we uh, have targeted this area. So I want you to comment on sort of how the facility will operate. Who's going to be in there? How the teachers? How many teachers you'll have? Children? The typical day? Sure. So it's a five-day week operation. Uh, no weekends typically outside of an open house uh, or maybe a marketing event. Uh, it's very seldom. Uh, the capacity is 194 students at full capacity. Uh, that's the building is based on uh, a licensed capacity with the state uh, division of child and family services. We'll have, if full capacity, you have somewhere around 25 staff on site. Uh, we run on average about 80% <coughs> occupied in a, in a successful school. It's 80%, 80? Yes, yeah. and that's a, that's a national average for us. Some schools have a wait list, some schools are a little less than that, but as an average, we're around 80% or so. Uh, we design our buildings for the convenience of the parents and obviously for the best. Uh, environment for the children attending there. And the age range of children will be in this facility? It'll be six months of age for infants to 12 years if we have uh, an after school program. Uh, Mr. Pavey did mention that's sort of an influx thing depending on what's offered. Uh, I apologize, I'm not fully familiar for Symphony as far as if you have a full uh, day kindergarten, which most, most communities have gone to, which really changes our realm, but uh, we also do not doing after school program, we do summer programs as well. So a lot of those end up being attended by siblings of younger kids in schools. But apart from the after school, the typical age of the children who were in the facility, can you comment on that? Younger kids for the most part? Yeah, it's typically younger children, uh, pre-kindergarten children. And you saw the floor plan that was put up before. There's flexibility in terms of how that will be used by the by the by Primrose, depending upon who's there? It is. We design uh, prototype for each state based on what our experience is in the state uh, as far as how many infants we have, how many toddlers we have. We try to design a school where a child can start there and all can go through uh, different age groups and rise through the school. So the, the mix is somewhat even that way. Uh, we find there's a bigger demand in one particular age group. There is some flexibility in changing the 
floor plan around or how the classrooms are licensed to accommodate that. A lot of that's based on the local market. You've heard talk about the playgrounds. Can you talk about how they're sized and what function they'll provide, how they're used? Sure. So as Mr. Pavey and actually the civil engineer had mentioned, the play area is around the building, so the child doesn't have to go through other parts of the building to get to their play area. They're, they're designed to be adjacent to the classrooms being served. They have age-appropriate equipment in them, depending on the age. They're separated for age group because you don't want, you know, five or six-year-olds playing with smaller kids. So it's, it's really set up uh, per age group, and they wrap the building that way, just like the classrooms. So, uh, there's a fence that keeps uh, the children uh, certainly in that area. I mean, they're supervised when they're out in the playground as well, but there's no way for them to get into the general public. Uh, you know, six-foot fence is a perimeter fence. Ms. Pay mentioned the security uh, precautions that are taken at the school. That's obviously an important part of the. It is, and it's become a you know an unfortunate, bigger, paramount issue for uh, all child care providers. So we have a very uh, you know, good program in place. The building is secured 24/7. You have to have a code to get in, uh, not only to the vestibule but also to the main area. And the parents will typically bring their child into the school. Yeah, the, the way the pick up and drop off works, and I apologize if I'm repeating this, and we've gone through it yet, but unlike a day school, what we, a lot of us may have had, certainly I have with, with my kids who are younger, um, it's not a situation where you have parents queued up to drop their children off or they're taken out of this car to drive off. You have to physically park your car, take your child or children out, bring them into the classroom, sign them in, you greet their teacher, you get back in the car. It's about a seven to 10 minute process Parents get pretty good at it, depending on you know where they're, where they're trying to go, um, you know, get to work. Uh, we designed the, the parking lot areas and the circulation to accommodate that. Uh, I know there's some discussion about how people are going to come and go. Parents are uh, they're pretty good about understanding the most efficient way to get their own children in, but also not to get in the way of others. So it's, it's a pretty significant community when it gets built. So uh, they're trainable. <laughs> and the parking lot design for this facility is consistent with other Primrose facilities. It's adequate in terms of its size. It's more, more than adequate. <coughs> more than adequate amount of parking. Yeah. I have no further questions for the witness. All right. I'll open up to board questions. I do. Yes, sir. Uh, I, you said uh, that the one, one sec. Uh, oh. Judy. Oh. Okay. Do you do backup care? Is that why it's twelve-year-olds or? You know. Um, I don't want to say we don't do backup care. We have that type of program in certain schools. <coughs> Tell us what that is for those. Yeah, who sure. So backup care would be a situation, say the school was located <coughs> on a corporate campus where you had a large provider, a large employer. Um, I always use an attorney as an example where um, if they don't have their child care at home, uh, an attorney can bring their child in. There's a slot for them. Mm -hmm. um, it's usually a, if something hasn't gone together for that person so they can actually get to work that day. So that's not so you That's not proposed that. here. I, I wouldn't say that our operators are pretty creative about if there was a corporate um, sponsor available who wanted to look at that situation. Um, it's worse. I was just curious because of the age. Yeah, range. no, it's, that's, that's something that uh, I developed more in an urban setting, you know, mm -hmm. Manhattan, um, Philadelphia, where, you, where you've got a big base of employers who are I see that I have a few more questions. There's sure. one kitchen, right? We have, uh, they call it, it's, we do. It's, okay. a, it's more of a warming pantry. We don't really prepare, don't prepare food the way you look at a restaurant. Uh, the food comes in pre prepared, uh, it's heated. We have steam ovens and items like that, but there's no open flame. It's not like you have uh, someone making a different meal every day. I mean, uh, the, the menu varies, but most of it is pre prepared. So like the infant room, if they have to warm the food, they go to the they go to the. The kitchen has a full time cook typically. Okay. Um, and they they would provide food for each age group. The infants typically are going to have their own provided <coughs> formula or uh, breast milk from their mother or from their parent. Anyway. Okay. And full time teachers have the kids from morning till the end of the day. That's a long day. It is a long day. Uh, now there's actually a fair amount of part time staff. That's the beauty of the way we staff our buildings and also we have a lot of um, folks that don't want to work full time. Yeah, and they're trained by the criminal yeah. curriculum or? Well, yeah, we pride ourselves actually on a fairly strong standard uh, as far as our teacher standards and you know, the, 
Child and Family Services in New Jersey has a fairly strict standard as well. Uh, they do one, they're one of the, uh, I think, better run states from that perspective. They're very focused on quality care. Mr. Perry? Yes, thank you. <coughs> you say you will operate until 6.30? Yes, sir. And what happens after that if the ch a child is not picked up by a parent? It becomes very expensive for a parent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, do that. Okay. I can attest yeah. to that. Yeah. I, can, I can attest to that. <laughs> um, you know, again, I, I go back to the sort of joke that parents are trainable. Okay. Like they really are. And it, it's one of those things that when everyone gets in a group, certainly there's certain times when something happens where a parent has a circumstance, and obviously there's a great relationship with center staff with that and those things happen but as a yeah. general rule um, you know everyone's on a long day it should be out the door fairly quickly okay are the uh, teachers uh, qualified for the uh, grades they teach absolutely okay and are they te are students tested after a period of time you know it, it's <coughs> we are not a certified curriculum with the state of New Jersey uh, we develop our own curriculum uh, that is administered in schools so it's not a there's certainly um, there's milestones, but I wouldn't want to look. I wouldn't want to say uh, it's a testing situation like a grade four, five, six, or seven. It's uh, it's really milestones that we set up in the way we designed our curriculum. We call it a balanced learning curriculum. It really gets kids ready for uh, kindergarten and beyond. Okay, is there a nurse on duty at the time during regular hours? Uh, we don't have a full time nurse. Oftentimes, many many of the staff are CPR certified. Certainly, the center director is as well. Uh, you, oftentimes, you have teachers who are nurses as well. So there's there's a there's never an issue with that. Okay. So if there is a problem, then uh, uh, there's an SOP set up so that uh, someone with uh, more absolutely. qualifications. And, it, and we develop uh, we I'm not including myself in this, but the operators who are operating the school, uh, the, the, one of the main people they develop really safety and fire and of course the police department so they make sure they all know each other and that you know first call is going to be the 911 in the um, but typically we partner with the community where we can all right thank you yeah. any other questions from the board yeah can you just a uh, little testimony on the uh, deliveries uh, the uh, how often what times and, and that and that like sure the deliveries can vary they're typically uh, what we call a standard straight job truck, which would be something akin to a larger UPS FedEx type truck. Uh, once in a while, there will be a delivery off of uh, an 18 wheel vehicle, but they're usually off hours. And we are, you know, it's very limited depending on what they're looking for. But the food service is typically delivered off a smaller vehicle. And how often? You know what? I would have to defer to our operator in this region talking next and oh. I, I just don't want to speak for uh, how she operates this school. Okay, thank you. Can you speak to the ADA accessibility of the, of the building? Obviously it's one story, but what about the outdoor facilities? Sure. No, we, we designed uh, the building basically to be a great site around it. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we meet all the ADA standards as far as sidewalk slopes. Um, you know, we certainly accommodate uh, children with what about the playgrounds? Uh, the, the playground structures are, are accessible to a degree, and I, mm -hmm. I will say it's out of my realm. Okay. Um, that's something that certainly our architect, Mr. Baby, can answer better than me. Uh, but I know we have a lot of discussions about keeping up with uh, being able to provide services to all children. Okay. Uh, how did you come in contact with this location? Well, we have a network of brokers um, that I work with, that my uh, business partners work with. Um, you know, we look at probably, I can eventually guess, a lot of sites here. And there's certain markets that we want to be in, and this is, this is one of them. So okay. It, it really just came up through a brokerage opportunity. So you found this uh, this landowner? Yes. Okay. Well, they found, we found each other in each other. Any other questions from the board at this time? All right. Uh, I'm going to ask we take Thank a so public. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, public. Any questions from the public? 
Okay. Uh, I think we should probably take a five minute recess at this point. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. Is everyone ready to get started again? All right. Back on the record. Back on the record. All right. Uh, we have one more witness for operation. Can I swear the witness? Would you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Would you state and spell your name for the record, please? Uh, Ashley Gray, A S H L E Y G R A Y. Your witness. Thank you. And Ms. Gray, you're also with Primrose? Uh, Wanda Franchise Owner, yes. Okay, so what your role in this project is you know, what, what will you do if this is approved? So I am the operator of this, of this location. So you're familiar with the plans, you're familiar with the testimony you've already heard tonight, how it's going to operate? Yes. A question here before about delivery. Can you tell us about that? How it will work at this site? How frequently it will be here? What kinds of trucks? Sure. So um, basically, uh, food deliveries are done once per week. Um, we usually use like an operator, like currently. I, I also operate the school, Springfield Mountainside School. Um, we usually use Cisco as our uh, vendor to provide food for the, the kitchen uh, for the chef. Um, and so those uh, deliveries typically come in once in a week, usually on like a Monday morning. Sometimes we have to if they lose some type of truck, which happens often, and it comes back on Tuesday. Um, but generally speaking, it's, it's a once a week delivery of food. And any of the deliveries you can think of that come on a regular basis, or is that pretty much it? Amazon. We use <laughs> a lot of Amazon. And those are typically some smaller box trucks as well, not tractor trailers? Yeah, no, those are definitely smaller trucks. But I would say the only time you see a tractor trailer, generally speaking, is when we really open the building because there's a big truck that backs in with all the equipment. Um, and then once that process is over, I don't think I've had one at the other school. Any other questions regarding deliveries or operations? So you have the milk delivered once a week, basically. Yeah, so you know what, that's actually true. We don't get our milk from uh, Cisco. We actually get that on a different day. Um, we, we only serve organic milk at, at my other school, and so I plan to do the same here. Uh, so we usually get that either directly through, at one point we were ordering through Whole Foods, um, and now- Get right up the road, you could. Right up the road, <laughs> exactly. Um, and then um, now I think we currently use Fresh Direct. So that usually comes on a separate day because we order milk separately from the bigger deli food delivery. The, the big food delivery comes once a week on like a Monday. Any other questions from the board? No. Sounds like an easy, uh, <laughs> easy call. Any questions from the public at this time? All right, no questions from the public. Thank you. Please continue. So our last witness is our planner, John McDonough. Raise your right hand, please. Do you swear the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Would you state and spell your name for the record, please? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is John McDonough, MC, capital D-O-N-O-U-G-H. Would you give the board the benefit of your qualifications and experience? Sure. I'm a licensed professional planner here in the state of New Jersey. I'm a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners. I'm a licensed landscape architect. I'm not testifying as a landscape <laughs> architect. <laughs> and I've testified before this board many, many times. And you're familiar with the case? <laughs> any questions regarding his qualifications as a planning consultant? Board, any questions about the qualifications? No. All right, okay. please continue. We're up to A9, Mr. McDonough. Perhaps we can mark your exhibit. Sure. I have some handouts for the board. Essentially, what this is is a packet of maps and photographs just to lay a foundation for my planning conclusions. Every variance application needs to relate to a distinct piece of property, otherwise, it's a, essentially a rezone. And these will give you some distinctive attributes of the property that really lay the foundation for my planning conclusions. How many sheets are in each of those? It's going to be six in each. So one. A9 would be a set of six sheets. Yes. That's prepared by your office. I'll start right. on my left. You're right. Here. Can we mark one of those for for the record? Yeah. Give you have to give you have to mark all of them, but just uh, just A9. Top one. Take them down, pass them around. Yep, take them down, pass them around. Do you want to put them in the photograph?
it in. Okay. You've yeah. heard testimony about the variances that are involved in this case. Perhaps you can run through what you each is doing individually and tell us why you believe the board should grant the variances based upon the case. Sure. Five variances before the board. They're all relatively <coughs> innocuous in consideration of the context that this site falls within. And just to flip you through the pages real quick, I, I noticed that to keep you on your toes, it's stapled in the upper right instead of the upper left. Upper left. <laughs> uh, anyhow, we're dealing with a very large piece of property. We're dealing with a piece of property that, as we know, was already developed with an office building and part of an office complex. The land use that is going here is a land use of many that we're seeing in a lot of the other office parks here in Parsippany. For example, we've got the uh, Bright Horizons over in the Cali office campus. We've got Goddard School over in the Mazda World campus. So it is a land use that certainly is compatible with an office park type of development. And it's actually something that the zone plan, the POD zone that this application is in, actually talks about. And it's actually something that your, your brand new master plan talks about on page 91 as well. The statistics that you heard our applicant talking about at the outset are almost echoed number for number in the, in the master plan as well, in the 2020 master plan. And that master plan and those statistics offer a springboard for the applicant and the application that's before you, which is encouraging this type of an amenity on these type of campuses given the pressure that they're under and the vacancies that they're under. So again, you get a sense of the piece of property here on page number two, the physical build out, and you do have a buffer system, which you can also see in the aerial photograph that the applicant has provided. I'll stay close to the microphone. Uh, the wooded condition, which will come out of my ground photographs with the fresh shots, will echo what you've heard the applicant's witnesses say. This is not a significantly healthy woodland. This is actually a woodland that's in poor condition. You'll see from my ground photographs, the vines that are there, the stunted trees that are there, and, and the pressure that this woodland is under. Importantly, there's sort of this notch that you see in the property, which is where the skate park is. That, as you've heard from your planner, that's a green acre, that's green acres land right there. It can't be developed for a house. So to the extent that the applicant is shrinking the buffer here, that it's not shrinking the buffer against what could potentially be a home. It is up against recreational land, which in and of itself becomes a buffer from the residential uses beyond. Importantly, as you heard from Mr. Gerentano's testimony, the buffer associated with the homes on Forest Drive is remaining intact. So the backyards that they presently enjoy will remain as is and as you see in the photographs on, on these pages. Page number three just shows the surrounding land use context. Red is non-residential, gold is residential, sort of at the cusp between the two. But again, importantly, we've got the nice green band in between that is going to protect this land use from that land. Page number four shows the zoning and the reason why we're here. We're in the POD zone district where this is a permitted principal use. This is a, a use that is a, allowed here in this zone district. So this, and, this is an accessory I'm use. I'm sorry, use. it's a permitted use, not a permitted principal use, correct. And we're ad adjacent to the R3 zone where buffering is important. And again, the applicant has preserved that buffer adjacent to those string of homes that we see on Forest Drive. So the R3 zone is the homes as well as the skate park. It's all the same zone. Yes, and that's the reason why we need the relief is because the skate park is still technically an R zone. It is not an, an open space zone, even though it is designated open space land. Frame number five is a fresh shot. I went out to the site this morning and took the photograph that you see in the first view. I'm getting on the skate park, looking back at the subject site, and you get a sense of the openness, the sparseness of the woodland, those stunted trees that don't have the expansive canopies, uh, and you can see the undergrowth there, the, the vines that are starting to grow up on the base of the trees as well. It is a lit park as well, so uh, again, to the extent that there are lights being associated with the subject development, you have even polar lights, even brighter lights that are associated with the skate park. And then finally, the last page shows the reverse view, which is a look back at the site from the office development. This is sort of a remote location of the office development where those parking spaces are relatively far. So 
this is a nice land use that will set in its own space, separate and apart, yet easily accessible to the workers that it will serve here. With that foundation, we'll walk you through the five variances that the applicant needs. The first is a variance related to uh, the overall coverage. Mr. Gerontano gave you the practical basis for that, that when that Whole Foods development came in, a portion of the overall tract was carved out, which triggered this variance for essentially any development within the tract as it now applies. Whenever we're dealing with land use, and particularly this land use, we look at the application as a whole. When there's a case out there known as the pulling case, which says when considering the benefits of the application, consider the application as a whole. And here we're dealing with a very specialized form of land use. It's as, as high a land use in terms of the way the statute looks at it as any land use. There are 136 sections in the municipal land use law, and this is the one land use that has a whole section devoted to it. And the land use, uh, the legislature actually concluded, and, and the quote says, this is a land use of vital importance. It goes through statistics, and just to echo some of the earlier statistics, the legislature put this together at a time in the 80s when this was being developed, when recognizing that 50% <coughs> of moms were entering the workforce. That's actually become even more important now because we're up to 75% of moms are in the workforce. So the land use continually gets more relevant and the statistics back that up. So all of the relief that the applicant needs ties to this beneficial land use. And if we were dealing with a use variance, we'd be dealing with an inherently beneficial use where the positive criteria are automatically satisfied. That said, this is a land use that is certainly going to benefit the workforce in the area and is also going to provide an amenity in this office park that we see in other office parks here in Parsippany as well. And you heard the applicant's reasons, the operational reasons, why that makes good sense in today's market. The site coverage is actually well below the 45% threshold on the particular site that's before the board. 38.9% is what the site coverage looks like uh, on the site itself. We know that the relief the applicant needs is to allow for 50.6%, whereas 45% is the maximum allowed, and 49.2% is what we see existing track-wide. But those numbers reflect the entire track. That's what's been different here than in typical case. That is correct. All of the benefits that I cited above promote purposes of the land use law, especially purpose A, the promotion of the general welfare, purpose M, the efficient use of land, purpose G, to provide for a variety of uses in appropriate locations, and I would also argue with the attractive building here that is going to be compatible with the surrounding residential area, the nice pitched roof, the overall scale of the building, that would also promote purpose I, the, the promotion of a desirable visual environment. Counterbalancing that with the negative side, relief can be granted without any substantial detriment to the surrounding public. Relief can be granted without substantial impairment to the zone plan and the ordinance. The zone plan to prevent overdevelopment is met here, and again, that site coverage isolated to the site itself is only at 38.9%. Second form of relief relates to the <coughs> overall height. And as you heard through Mr. Gerontano, that is to allow for four feet above the maximum allowed or the average mean sea level. The building itself is only one story. It's adjacent to a building that is multiple stories. So this is not going to be a building that is going to stand out as, as obtrusive in the overall landscape. It's really related to its position on the landform itself. In terms of the flexible sea balancing test, the relief only relates to the roof and the fact that we have that, that extra decorative component. If this were a flat roof, it would comply with the ordinance. The truss level complies at 372 feet. To go above the 375 foot threshold is to have that, that peaked, reef, uh, peak, peaked roof. So again, the height relief is necessary to effectuate a beneficial <coughs> use and to effectuate <coughs> aesthetics counterbalancing that with no substantial detriment to the surrounding public and no substantial impairment to the zone plan intent to avoid obtrusive structures. Third relief is for the buffer. And again, this only relates to the area associated with the skate park. 
Relief is mitigated by the incorporation of additional landscaping. And again, the buffer that's in place now is not serving any real practical purpose given the physical condition of the buffer that's there. In terms of the balancing, again, all of the benefits that were cited above carry forth. This will effectuate a beneficial project. The buffer to the homes itself is unaffected and will remain intact. And the vertical separation, the differential in grade, makes up for that lack of horizontal buffer separation as well. To the extent, again, that relief can be granted without substantial impairment to the zone plan intent and the surrounding public. <coughs> With respect to the slope relief and those two categories of relief that Mr. Gerentano spoke about, I think the board can move both under the C1 hardship standard and also under the C2 balancing standard. The hardship here, the practical difficulty, is that the slopes, or the man-made slopes, relate to the parking lot that was cut into the grade. So we're talking about a band of slopes that wrap around the drive, the parking lot that is now there and impacts any additional development on this particular lot, notwithstanding the development that's before you. So again, any land use, any additional expansion here would warrant that relief. In terms of the C2 balancing, again, the relief here would effectuate this beneficial use with no substantially adverse or detrimental impacts associated with the disturbance of those man-made slopes. Finally, with respect to the signage relief, I would offer that that also passes the C2 balancing test, whereby the benefit of clear and safe identification of the site, navigation aids will guide one through to the child care center and back out of the child care center. I believe that represents a safety benefit, again, without creating or violating the planning intent to avoid overbranding, visual clutter, or the like. These signs are going to be tasteful and blend very well with the overall landscape and office park theme. Paul said this is a very positive land use application. It's recognized as beneficial in the statute. It's right on par with what's talked about in your master plan. And in that regard, I believe the statutory tests for relief are met and approval is warranted here. Thank you. Any questions from the board? All right. Um, okay. Uh, seeing no questions from the board, I'll open it up to public questions of this witness. All right. Nope. Uh -huh. okay. All right. Are there any comments from the public at this time? All right. Uh, is, is that your? Uh, I'll, I'll do a very brief summation. It's late. Thank the board for your attention tonight. Hopefully, we've answered all your questions. If you think of some others, they're still here. We're happy to answer them for you. I think in some, we think this is a very attractive project, one that we hope will kind of energize this site and some of the surrounding areas. It still has sort of a regional benefit for Parsippany as well as benefiting the site in particular. It's a good use from a great provider who has a good track record in New Jersey. It's a very attractive product. The variances, although there are five variances, I think are relatively minor given the scheme of things in this project. We've done just went through those. So